from the sneaky Solarians in Combat Patrol to effectively taking cover and learning how to paint swamps, it's all here in White Dwarf Issue number 496. Hello, I'm Miranda and welcome to my channel. We're gonna jump right in here with a little word from the managing editor, Lyle Lowry. Hi, Lyle. Uh, and he talks about the butterfly effect, which is basically the idea of floating from project to project within the Games Workshop sphere. So in this case, there's a lot of focus on Combat Patrol. And Combat Patrol, for those of you who don't know, is just a small, complete army in a box with specific rules that's like 90% 40K, 10th edition, uh, that you can just assemble, paint, and play with without having to deal with the whole list building idea. Um, the benefit of that is that you can just buy an army box of Space Marines and buy an army box of Astro Militarum and buy an army box of Eldari. You just have so many choices that allows you to float like a butterfly from army to army while you figure out what it is you like. And on the contact page, we've got a model of the month that is definitely worth highlighting. It is uh, the lion as painted by Daniel Vallejo. And you can see the absolutely gorgeous, stunning detail put into this model. Beautiful specularity. Uh, the effect on the sword is one of my favorite things on here. The details in this model are completely incredible. In the January issue of The Bunker, they do conclude the Slide Crown Sundering campaign and offer a preview of the next campaign that White Dwarf will be doing. Uh, they are going to be running a Warhammer 40k Crusade battle. Uh, so this will be interesting to see because of course Crusades, you have your same army that go from battle to battle and grow during the campaign. So it'll be fun to see how they progress with that. And the January painting challenge is to paint up your rank and file. And real quick, I don't know if you guys follow the challenges in here. I'm kind of debating doing that with the whole new year and the idea of specifically focusing on any of these models. Do you find that helpful? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious if you follow any of that or if you just paint whatever it is you get. Um, let me know in the comments if you can. And the new 40K mission for this month is called Scattered Deployment. Uh, the board is quartered in your deployment, so you actually deploy on opposite corners, uh, half of your army and the other half of your army, or however you work it out. And then there's a prime objective in the very center of the board that is worth the most points. So everyone's kind of running toward the middle to try and control that objective for the most VP. And the Age of Sigmar battle plan for this month is called the Battle of Carcass Daunts. And for you Warcry fans out there, there is a sort of campaign being offered in this month's White Dwarf called Scales of War, which gives you several different battle plans and a um, structure for how to play these games and rank players. So you have a whole campaign set up you can, you can do if you are Warcry players. Next up, we've got Steven Box giving us a little bit of information on how to take cover in 40K. Most specifically, how to effectively take cover and understanding the terrain rules properly. This article gives really good examples of how line of sight works from and to each model because a model that can be seen by another model may or may not have cover based on where that targeting model is. Um, and so one model of the two might have cover and the other one wouldn't. So it gives you, again, several examples of how either a unit being in cover or a single model being in cover applies, uh, when cover applies based on the infantry keyword, when cover applies just based on true line of sight. So really, really good information in here on uh, how to effectively use that, including some good clarification on models that have the towering rule and utilizing uh, the first floor of ruined buildings. Next up on the hobby hangout side, we've got Steve Barrett showing us a quick but effective way of painting up some sweet Warcry terrain, uh, which is what which was what they were using for the Slide Crown Sundering terrain. Uh, really cool ways of painting the trees, uh, different stone ropes for the bridges that were used to create the boards. Uh, so some really cool techniques here. Again, using a lot of dry brush and. Uh, cool extra stuff um, like bracken, uh, which is just a specific accessory, a hobby terrain accessory that you can get. Um, just pile on and add some nice details to your environments. 
then we have the conclusion of the slide crown sundering. So there have been three factions kind of vying for power over the last few issues, and that's all culminated here to see what finally happened. Um, the preservers are trying to maintain the crown, the obliterators are trying to destroy the crown, and then you have the rogues that are kind of playing both sides, and depending on if they have their way, completely just stealing the crown. And if you or your FLGS were participating in the slide crown sundering, the stories for whether or not obliteration or preservation or the thieves won are all in here. Now, who won here at the Warhammer Studio? Well, I will leave that for those of you who get the magazine. And a special shout out to Emily Ridding's Seraphon team of the Warhammer Studio. Absolutely beautifully painted models. Of course, I have a soft spot for the Seraphon anyway because dinosaurs, uh, but beautiful work, Emily. Next up, we have Echoes from the Warp, which is a focus on the Admech detachment rules. So the Admech Codex had come out fairly recently, and this goes over the different detachment options that are in there. Uh, specifically with benefits that go to models that you choose to bring. And so you get a little bit of extra flavor and some cool additional enhancements and stratagems uh, based on kind of what models you're choosing to bring or what you want to apply that to. So it adds a little bit of strategic depth. And you get really cool names like Cohort Cybernetica. And so each of these detachments gives you an enhancement where you can put a special ability on a, a model like a tech priest. Uh, and then also there is the actual stratagem, which would cost a CP to use. And, you know, which, whichever theme you're kind of wanting to go with, just, you know, you get that little bit of flavor or maybe leans a little bit more into a play style you like. And next up, there is a new strike force for the Space Marines, the Strike Team Solarian. They are Phobos armor, I hope I'm saying that right, Space Marines that are designed to be infiltrators. Now, the ones that are the examples in the magazine are Raven Guard, but as it says in here, you can really choose any types of models you want to have, that, any Space Marine chapter to have this Strike Team benefit. One of the neat units in this new strike team are the infiltrator squads, which have these omni scramblers, which prevent deep strike within 12 inches of them. And since you can take that squad and actually split them into two units, you actually have a lot of board control or board blocking to prevent deep strike in against your infiltrating models. And then your Lieutenant Solarian has the, basically the sticky objectives ability, just like um, Cadian shock troops. So if they control, an, if he controls an objective, he can leave it and still have it under his control as long as no one else comes and takes it, which is very handy for collecting your victory points. Alternatively, you can give him the Stealthy Hunter ability, which gives him anti-infantry four, devastating wounds, and the precision ability. So that would be more like using him as an assassin figure rather than for taking objectives. So it kind of depends on the playstyle that you are going for. Then you have the super heavy hitting suppressor squad, which have accelerator auto cannons. So there's three models, each getting three shots, ballistic skill four up, but uh, strength eight on the attack, which is no joke, AP minus one, two damage a piece. So they are really gonna be taking out some of your higher value targets um, for the game. And finally, the librarian Zarius, one model, uh, he has, the smite ability being a psyker, but he also has a special psychic ability called shrouding. So if he's attached to a unit, he can give the entire unit stealth. And I'm going to interrupt myself here real quick just to ask that if you are enjoying this content and this review, please make sure to let me know by giving this a thumbs up on the video. And if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more content like this. All right, back to the review. All right, now we get a little bit of a lore section called Index Xenos. So we are learning a little bit more about the Necrons and the dynasties that don't all get along, as one might know. Um, I got to learn that there is another warlord king uh, named Imotek, who was sort of raised to try and unite the clans or unite the dynasties. And uh, the person who raised him was immediately enslaved by him because he was a crazy warlord who wants to, you know, 
unite all of the <laughs> dynasties against the Silent King. Now, Imatek's approach is apparently more honorable than the tactics used by the Silent King. Imotek would give warnings to his opponents with flyers and the option to surrender and kind of every way to avoid conflict prior to an actual engagement. So he had built a reputation for kind of people not really wanting to fight him. He, he wants again the Necrons to all unite uh, rather than fighting each other all of the time. We've got another article in here, another lore piece, uh, Acolyte, which is part of the Still Faith well, part one, so presumably there's more, about an up-and-coming inquisitor who is going after gene stealer cults. But of course, there is a bigger plan at play. The next article in here is called Operational Offensives. So for those of you who are playing Combat Patrol, this gives you a multi-game format so that you can, I guess, build a bit of a story uh, around your army without it just being a bunch of one-off games. So they give you a few different operational offenses, so the name of the campaign, and it's a three game format in which, you know, there's not really any special rules for that first round, but then there will be new rules that are introduced for the second and third game that give you a little bit more flavor to playing your combat patrol games. So an example of that would be like for game two, uh, Advance Recon. Uh, when the victor of game one has to choose an objective marker to be the gamma or beta objective marker, they do not have to do so randomly. So normally you would pick it randomly, but for game two, the victor, they get to choose. So just little things like that to give you a bit of a advantage or again, change it up. And of course the Warhammer team wasn't quite done with the slide crown sundering. It was such a successful and interesting narrative campaign that some of the team members decided to put together a 2,000 point game uh, to kind of continue that story a bit or, or relive it a bit. Now normally the games have been at a smaller points level so they did have to scale up a bit and they changed the range you need to be within the objective markers for example in order to help scale up to 2,000 points and the full battle report is in here. Then there's a sweet AOS article in here that talks about named weapons and a little bit of their history like the obelisk of Tor Crania or Smasha and Runa. Gee is that an auric weapon? but the little bits of story that go with each of these weapons because of course as a weapon gets forged and used from battle to battle it starts to have its own recognition and name and history so you get a bunch of that in here next up we've got the tale of four warlords uh, the january challenge by the way the goal is to paint a vanguard box set that can be fielded as allies to your existing forces or to paint an additional vanguard box set for an entirely different faction. Then we have follow-ups from our warlords, the Maggotkin of Nurgle by Jake Bowley. And one of our warlords swapped out, Sebastian Torsil joins us with the Stormcast Eternals, always beautiful looking models, and he did a lovely job on these. Lara Manarasso joining in with the o uh, Osiarch Bone Reapers. Uh, of course, she always does beautiful work as well. And then Chris Childs with the Cruel Boys. Next up, again for you AOS players, uh, there's an article called Siege Warfare, which talks about multiplayer AOS games. And there's an actual warfare uh, battle pack in this month's issue that shows you, you know, that lays out how to play your multiplayer games in Age of Sigmar. Then we hop over to the Rules of Engagement, where the Warhammer team talks about what goes into making the General's Handbook each year, but specifically what went into the General's Handbook for the 2023 to 2024 um, story campaign for Age of Sigma. So for 2024, they have chosen to put the campaign setting in the frozen tundra of Antor, uh, and they go over lessons from prior general's handbooks to incorporate them here, uh, to see what rules have worked really well, what rules have worked poorly, and just constantly how the process is refined with each edition. Um, so if you're curious about your battle pack, I mean, it's already out from what I can tell, uh, but this one is all frozen icy themed uh, with wizards, lots of wizards. Then there's a really cool Necromunda article in here called Ferrostack 125. And it is an examination of this beautiful vertical Necromunda board. 
and there are some beautiful highlights in here of how they made this board. It's over five feet long, over two feet tall, and six inches deep as this cool diorama. Well, I mean, really, it's like a dollhouse that you can fight on. So your necromendigings are climbing up, you know, ladders and stairs and pew pewing each other at all these different levels. I think Necromunda works probably especially well on a vertical board. I mean, if you just think about it, it's a hive city, so verticality seems like it would be a natural part of it, way more than you know what you would think of a traditional battle on a table. And while that exists too, it just seems to add a really cool flavor. I don't know if you've ever played on a vertical board. I haven't, but looking at the details in here definitely makes me want one. And if you think about it, it's also probably pretty space efficient, because so you could just, you know, it might come off the wall a bit, but it's, pretty tidy, right? And then you could play your cool like Necromunda game with your friends and you don't even have to take up the kitchen table. And finally, the Black Library segment of White Dwarf follows Tome Keeper Ushazar uh, as he's dealing with an attack on his world and trying to, during this process, has been sent to study these battles to try and figure out what these invaders are going after so that they can deny them. And the Tome Keepers have been showing up a fair bit uh, in these recent White Dwarf issues because I think they're going to be the ones to uncover Bashtor's plans. At least that's what I suspect will be the case. I've really grown to enjoy the Tome Keepers. I didn't know anything about them before these last few issues of White Dwarf, but the idea of, you know, these warrior librarians that take excessive detail over every single battle and then make a point to study every single battle in order to improve their fighting style, I have a lot of respect for that. And they have a really cool armor scheme too. So even though I am, of course, a loyal guard player, if I did have a Space Marine army, I think I would go with the Tome Keepers because they have some really neat lore and again, a really cool aesthetic that I enjoy. So if any of you out there do play Tome Keepers, let me know how they play. I think they follow the Codex Astartes, the Ultramarines rule set, is that right? And that concludes my review of White Dwarf issue number 496. Did you have a favorite article in here? Maybe the Strike Team Solarians are of interest. Maybe you like the basic training as much as I do. Or all the little lore pieces. That Necromunda board was pretty awesome, right? Let me know what your favorite was in the comments. Um, also, I wanted to give a special thanks to my friend Fulvius. He got me this brand new Astra Militarum issued crack grenade. So thank you so much, Fulvius. It was really cool of you. I can always use more of these, you know? Let's see, so how does this work? Pin, oh crap.